This is episode eight of Baba Yaga's Magic, Magical Foods in Slavic Spirituality. Food is magical. The food you take in, the food you give to others, the food that you offer to the spirits can all be imbued with your spells, your incantations, and your magic. Many cultures have magic spells that involve food, but there are some very special spells in Ukrainian and Slavic magic that involve what we eat and drink. Food and drink can charm the spirits. You can offer a treat to a Domovic, a Lisovic, or Rusalki, and they may be inclined to help you. And all meaningful interactions with our beloved ancestors also involve offering them food and drink. And of course, you can charm food and drink to feed to others. This podcast, we're going to look at seven of the most magical Slavic foods and how they are used in magic. But before we dive in, if you have questions about Slavic magic, well, I have some very exciting news for you. There is a way that you can meet with me for free and ask me your questions about general magic or Slavic magic. We can talk about spells, spirituality, witchcraft, folk magic, spirits, divination, and so much more. Join me on Sundays for the live podcast recording and for the extra bonus content, an all live Q&A after the podcast. It's free to join. All you have to do is be a member of the Spell Squad. And to do that, all you have to do is sign up at spellsquad.com. It takes place every Sunday, except for the first Sunday of the month at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern. So go ahead over to spellsquad.com and sign up today so you can join the Spell Squad. You'll get a ton of free goodies and you'll get the link to join me and have a cup of tea and download some very deep spiritual knowledge. It's always fun in the clubhouse, and I'd love to see you there. All right, let's talk about food and magic. There is so much magic associated with food in Ukrainian magical practice and also in Slavic magical practices. We're going to be focusing mostly on what I know about food from my life and Ukrainian magic. And I bet if you are someone who has studied Slavic magic, you will see lots of crossover with other countries, other Slavic and Eastern European, Balkan countries, and so on. You'll see a lot of crossover here. Now, food to me is magical from the get-go. This is a lot of the magic that I had growing up when I was growing up. Food was everything. My mom was an amazing cook. She cooked Ukrainian dishes. She cooked what we called pierogi, which is a Polish word, but vreniki. She cooked those. She cooked cabbage soup called kapusta soup. She cooked uh, halupchi, which are uh, cabbage rolls. I mean, she cooked amazing, amazing food. She had bread, how she cooked bread. I mean, she cooked amazing food. And one of the things is that with food, we had lots of little magic spells that we did. For example, one of the things that we did was at Easter time, we would have a ritual where we would take a crush on key, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. A crush on key was an egg that is dyed a single color, just like our regular Easter eggs, right? We would take a crush on key and we would crack it open. You might play a little game with it. There was a little game where you hit your egg against someone else and someone else's egg and whoever's egg stays intact is the winner. Um, and then whoever's the champion of all of the eggs going around the table was the super champion. It was a lot of fun. But we, after we cracked those eggs, we uh, those hard boiled eggs, we uh, did a little ritual. And my mom would take a little piece of that egg and bless us by giving each member of the family a little piece of that egg and putting it in their mouth with a blessing. It was a really super traditional Ukrainian thing. Ukrainian people do this all the time. And it's a really magical thing. It's magic. You're doing a spell. You're doing a blessing spell through the food. Another way that we used to do magic when I was growing up, another thing that just popped into my head is that we used to, uh, my mom used to do a thing where if she went to a wedding, she would bring back a piece of wedding cake and wrap it up in foil. And then she would bring it back to me and she'd give it to me. And she'd say, okay, we're going to put this under your pillow. And tonight you're going to dream about your future husband. So <laughs> So this is another form of divination magic, dream magic, and magic that we did with wedding cake, because wedding cake is supposed to have that magical property of being able to help you have a divination about your uh, future relationship. But there are so many 
so many rituals about food and magic in Slavic lore. I mean, it's one of the primary tools of magic because it's an everyday thing, but it's something that you take into your body and taking it into your body brings the magic into your actual cells. So it's very, very powerful magic. So I'm going to talk to you about seven of the very most magical foods in Ukrainian mat in Ukrainian food magic. And we're going to talk about those and what we can do with those. And I'm going to give you a few spells today. And it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So the first one I want to talk about relates to that cake that we talked about a little bit. And it's about grain, zerno or grain. Grain is very old magic. Anything with any grains is considered very, very old magic. We have evidence of the Trapillion people of 7,000 years ago performing magical rituals in their granaries where they stored their grain 7,000 years ago. Hard to believe, but that was happening for that long. And there's continuity with that magic going even till today. Grain is very magical because it has a quality of bringing in sun magic and earth magic together. Very, very powerful. The earth in uh, Ukrainian tradition is a very, very powerful uh, being. It's not just a force. It's not just a um, amorphic thing. It's seen as a very living being. Mati Siri Zemlia, Mati Zemlia, Holy Mother Earth, right? So Mother Earth, the actual Earth is seen as very powerful and the sun is very powerful. And we bring those two together when we work with grain. Even today, we see a, a remnant of this in the ritual breads that are created that are baked into a round shape. That round shape is a talismanic symbol for the sun. Sun is a circle for millions of years you know, beings have seen the sun and the sky hundreds of thousands of years for human beings. And we've seen that round shape as symbolic of the sun and those round breads that are baked for rituals in that round shape are also symbolic of that sun energy. Now, grains don't just show up in bread, although bread, chlieb is very, very important in magic. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But even the little grains that we have um, that are cooked in other ways are very powerful. There's a wheat porridge called kutya. It's made with wheat berries, honey, poppy seeds, which are all very magical ingredients. And it's a special porridge that takes a lot of effort to make. And it's given as an offering to the ancestors around the holidays. So kutya is made particularly at the winter holidays, winter solstice, Christmas, so on. It's made around those holidays and made as an offering to the ancestors. Very, very magical. Chlieb bread, chlieb, um, is also very important in Ukrainian cookery and in Ukrainian magic, right? Bread is the head of everything, is a Ukrainian saying. Bread is everything. It's not just food. It is so much more than that. Bread is a symbol of hospitality. If you've ever seen an image of a, a welcoming ceremony in Ukraine, I remember there was one where um, then Vice President Biden was visiting Ukraine. This is, you know, 10 years ago. And um, he was being offered the symbol of hospitality, this very, very no, this very typical Ukrainian thing, which is to offer someone a loaf of bread with a little bowl of salt in the top, another very magical food, salt. This offering of the bread is a symbol of hospitality and welcome. It incorporates so much magic into it because when you take that bread, the guest takes a piece of that bread and dips it in the salt and then eats it. That is a way of doing a spell for your guest for prosperity and happiness and long life and health and well being and protection. All of these things that we want to wish our new friends, our loved ones, and so on is incorporated in that hospitality ritual. Now, bread was so important that there were a lot of rules of, and magical rules about working with bread. You would never throw away a piece of bread, even if it was stale, old, and terrible, or you had crumbs that were on the table. Those were never thrown in the trash. The crumbs or the stale bread was always shared with the birds or the animals or thrown into the air as an offering to the spirits. It was never thrown away. 
The reason it wasn't thrown away is that it was believed that if you threw away your bread, you were throwing away your wealth and your luck. You didn't want to th- toss that out. That's a terrible idea, right? And the other thing is too, is that your bread also carried your energy because in the old days you made your own bread, you put your energy and blessings and so forth into it. And if you threw away a piece of that bread, an enemy who was could work some harmful magic on you could pick up that bread and it was like a personal concern. It could it was attached to you and could be used to harm you. Even bread that fell on the ground was never tossed away. I remember my mother doing this. She would drop something on the floor and it was like the five second rule. If you could pick it up right away, she would kiss it up to God. And that was her way of clearing and cleansing the bread from anything that happened on the ground, any kind of dirt or anything on the ground, and it was safe to be eaten. So anything that fell on the ground, you'd kiss it up to God and you could eat it, right? So this is another magical way of working, you know, why bread was so, so, so uh, precious and so magical and was really seen as a magical tool. Bread shows up in songs. People sing about it. They swear on a loaf of bread when they're making agreements. It's Bread loaves are included in the construction of a new home. Sometimes wheat grains are used in the construction of a new home or bread. Bread rituals show up in marriage ceremonies. When we welcome a newborn into the family, when we are having uh, a ceremony to see our loved ones off to the afterlife after they've passed on. And bread is also used in spells for healing and getting rid of the evil eye and curses. Now, before you would bake your bread, because bread was baked in the home once a week, you would ask for a blessing from the spirits before breaking that bread. And you would never disrespect the bread by swearing or cursing. If you did that, that was really inviting a, a, something bad into your home. This is often a, um, a sort of a a forbidden thing to do whenever doing magic is to swear or to curse when you are doing something magical and making bread was seen as something magical. At the end of the episode, I'm going to be giving you a bread divination, which is so, so cool. But let's move on to the next food that is so magical. Honey, honey. If you've looked at my Instagram lately, if you're listening to this podcast, you might have to go back a couple week or two. But if you listen to my, if you look at my Instagram, I had a little video of me and my cats having a little beautiful party with an amazing honey cake. Honey cake. Medovic is a honey cake. So, so beautiful. It was the most delicious cake I've ever had. I didn't make it by the way. Ukrainian baker here, Yana, who's linked in the, in the uh, Instagram story. You'll see her in the Instagram, uh, in my feed, but anyway, so she made this gorgeous cake. I got it from her, bought it from her and, um, I had just enjoyed it. My cats came around. And so I shot this fun video. I wasn't planning on the cats being there, but they showed up because the cake was so good and so magical. Honey is really a very, very magical ingredient. It's a sacred talisman. And it was considered to be the food of the gods, People would use honey to bless their livestock. They would take a little bit of honey on their thumb and smear a cross of honey between the eyes of their cows, their sheep, or their animals on the farm to bless them. To this day, people take honey and add it to water and wash their face to enhance their beauty magically, right? It's said to bring in beauty. Eating honey with a prayer is going to bring in that sweetness into your life and be able to bring in a better life, a more blessed life. And honey's magical, most magical quality is that it is long lasting and sticky. So if you do a spell with honey, it is going to last long. It can last a long time, even a lifetime. So make sure that the spell that you do with your honey is something that you want for your whole life. Probably good to do things like health, wealth, success, love in your life. Maybe making that person love you with honey. If as long as you want them to stick around your whole life, then go at it. But be careful about that because it is going to be hard to undo. Honey was seen as a healer and an aphrodisiac. You could use it for spells of passion, spells of love, to bring sweetness to your spell work. And, And you could 
use honey, enchanted honey, to make someone sweeter towards you so that they would be more agreeable towards you and perhaps even subordinate to you. Bees who make the honey um, were considered to be messengers from the heavens. So killing a bee was a no-no, a big no-no, because that was killing a heavenly messenger. You wouldn't do that. Beekeepers in the community were usually the older men of the community, the grandfathers and so on. They're called the DD. The DD are the grandfathers, right? And the most skilled ones, I love this, the most skilled beekeepers were called Pasichnik Cherivnik. Pasichnik Cherivnik means beekeeper magicians, beekeeper magicians, because they would charm the bees. They would sing to the bees. They would control the bees with incantations. It was really, really cool. So let's talk about our next magical food. This one is so universal. I think it shows up in most European magic. We see this and some Asian magic as well. Garlic, chasnik, garlic. Garlic, of course, is used for spells and rituals for banishing. Um, it's also used for protection from evil spirits or from protection from people with bad intentions. It was thought that people that were frightened of garlic were people with bad intentions. So if you met someone who refused to eat garlic or who was uncomfortable with eating garlic, you might want to keep your distance from them because it may be that they had bad intentions towards you. Another thing that could be used with garlic in um, magically is if a stranger that you weren't sure about or an unpleasant person came into your home, you could put a couple of cloves of garlic on the table. That garlic would neutralize the negativity of that person if they were, if you weren't sure about them or you thought they were not a nice person, that they wouldn't leave their negativity or their ill will or their curses or their evil eye or any of that in your home. Now there's loads of spells that you can use with garlic. And a lot of these spells, it's very interesting with the food spells. You can eat the food or you can use the food. So you can use a personal protection spell with garlic by taking a piece of garlic, super simple. If you need protection, take a piece of garlic and rub it over your body. That's one way you can do a protection spell with garlic right on the fly. Or if you've got a little more time, you could thread a clove of garlic, you know, take a needle and thread, make a long necklace, and you could wear it as a charm around your neck, or you could just carry a clove of garlic in your pocket. If you have a little baby, you could hang a clove of garlic over the cradle to protect that little one from the evil eye. Or as I mentioned before, you could wear that garlic around your neck or you could wear it around your waist during the day to protect yourself from evil spirits or evil people. Or at nighttime while you're sleeping, you could stick a clove of garlic under your pillow and that would also keep that negativity at bay. In your house, a braid of garlic tied with a red string and hung next to the door could be used to protect the home from evil people and evil spirits. But you need to know that if you do that, you cannot use that garlic or any of this garlic that you're using for protective, you know, protection magic in your pocket around your neck or above your baby's cradle and so on. You never want to eat that garlic because it is absorbing that negativity. And so it should never be eaten. It's just hung there as a way of absorbing that negativity. You can also cleanse your house with garlic by putting a garlic clove in each room overnight. And the next morning, you would need to pick it up by scooping it up with paper, not touching it with your hands, just scoop it up with a couple piece of cardboard or piece of paper, and then throw it away, throw them all away, throw the paper away as well. If you've got some funky neighbors that you do not like, noisy neighbors, they're troublemakers, they're throwing trash in your yard or partying all night long or doing something like that, you could make a little garlic spell to get rid of them. So with this spell, you would just take uh, face the West and you would have three bay leaves, three black peppercorns, three dill seeds and a head of garlic and put them all into a glass jar or bottle. Then you'd whisper the words, connect these as a whole and stock up on strength connect these as a whole, stock up on strength. Then you'd shake the bottle three times and then hide it in the secret place on the neighbor's property. And then they should be gone. It's going to send them away. 
Um, all right, so now let's move on to the next beautiful magical food, poppy seeds. Nasinya maku, maku is poppy. Uh, so poppy seeds were are still a very protective talisman that can reverse negativity and protect against evil. Poppy is often shows up in offerings for the ancestor spirits, but they can be used in so many ways. If you sprinkle poppy seeds on a pathway, it was believed that no evil spirit could pass until they have collected and counted them all. Well, if you've ever seen poppy seeds, they're teeny, teeny, tiny. And if you sprinkle a bunch of them on the path, well, they're not going to be collected. It's going to be a way to protect you against evil people, evil spirits. They find these little poppy seeds irresistible. It's like their OCD says they have to count them and collect them and count them. And keeping them busy in that way can allow us to do our everyday activities without being bothered by these um, negative people or negative spirits. Um, poppy seeds could also be poured in front of the threshold of your house so that enemies would not be able to pass through the door. The same reason it was thought that you that they would stop at the door and pick them up if they had an evil intent. Now, you get poppy seeds from the store, of course, but it was thought that the most powerful way to use poppy seeds was from a dried field poppy. And once it's dried, you shake those seeds out of the poppy pod and you shake all those seeds out. And that was considered to be the most powerful. Now, another really magical um, food in um, Slavic culture are mushrooms, khribi in Ukrainian. So mushrooms are considered so special and really they are special. I mean, mushrooms, people are talking about mushrooms, both psychedelic mushrooms and non-psychedelic mushrooms a lot, it seems like these days, because we're discovering more and more, science is discovering more and more about mushrooms. They're not really a plant and they're not really an animal. They're like something alien, like this amazing, strange alien thing. If you know a little bit about how trees communicate, they communicate through mushroom spores through fungus is how they can they communicate so it these amazing magical mushrooms are just so otherworldly and powerful and of course very magical now in western european magic and in uh english-speaking countries we have something called fairy circles fairy circles are circles of mushrooms and as you know they grow in smaller small ones then bigger and bigger and bigger rings of mushrooms the older those rings get, and they are somehow connected. They're not one plant, but there's a connection between those um, mushrooms. It's very, very magical. So these fairy circles are known as vidmine kiltse, witch rings in Ukrainian. So the witch rings, we, we think of in like English magic or Celtic magic of uh, the fairy circles or fairy rings being a place where the fairies gathered. Well, in Ukrainian magic, it was believed that these are the places where witches would gather for their rituals and that the mushrooms found in these circles were thought to be enchanted mushrooms. Con collecting mushrooms and going mushroom hunting is such a huge part of Slavic life. I mean, in the Carpathian mountains and mountain regions like the Carpathians, which is where my family's from, mushroom hunters go out into the forest. It's like a family event. You go with your friends, you might go by yourself, but it's like this way of exercising, being in nature, and also finding beautiful mushrooms that can be eaten and used. From June until October, people go into the forest to find gorgeous mushrooms under the pines and the fern firs and the oaks and the birch birches all the trees around them and they find these beautiful mushrooms there now in folklore magical mushrooms mushrooms were thought to be a creation of the lisovuk remember the lisovuk from our prior podcast is the lord of the forest and so everything so all the magic surrounding mushroom hunting would involve the lisovuk Many people would start their mushroom hunt by being, bringing an offering to the Lord of the forest before they began their search. Because if you make an offering to a spirit, the spirit is more inclined to help you. And so a loaf of bread, another magical thing, or an egg, another magical thing, or some other appropriate food offering would be left for the Lisevuk and an incantation would be spoken to ensure that you had a safe and a very fruitful mushroom hunt. The incantation that was spoken translates to 
as I go to collect mushrooms, I will say this spell in order not to be poisoned by mushrooms and to return with a full basket. Let it be so. I mean, that's a real straightforward incantation. I don't want to be poisoned. I want a full basket of delicious mushrooms. You know, so be it, right? So there's also a divination ritual that was done before mushroom hunting. People would take their gathering basket and throw it up in the air and say, Lord of the wood, give me a full basket. And if the basket fell down to the ground and landed upright, that they would have a good day of picking. But if it fell upside down, it would be a difficult day. They might not get a full basket that day. There were other charms that would help in having a successful mushroom hunt. If you had a good, positive, optimistic attitude, that would really make a difference between finding mushrooms or coming up with nothing. So there's a proverb. If you're happy, you'll go mushroom hunting. If you're unhappy, you'll just go for a walk in the woods, meaning you won't find any mushrooms. So mushrooms were believed as these little spirits, these little beings were believed to be shy because they like to hide under leaves. So when you're a mushroom hunting, you would walk through the forest quietly. You wouldn't speak too loud or sing, and you certainly wouldn't swear. You know, that's another one. You don't want to swear. And that would make you more successful at finding these little shy mushrooms. Now, lastly, if you found a good mushroom picking spot and you were a mushroom hunter and you gathered a good har harvest, there was a, you were forbidden from bragging about your success. If you bragged about, oh, I, I got so many mushrooms and it was so abundant for me and I did so well. If you bragged about it, it would drive away your luck or someone else would find your secret mushroom spot and get there before you did the next time. So didn't want to do that. All right. Another magical food are eggs. Eggs are really sacred magical objects in Slavic lore and legend, and they are treated with so much special reverence because each of the eggs has an egg yolk, a little yellow yolk that is an image of the sun. It was believed that the birds were the only ones that could fly to the sun, which was such a powerful, holy, divine thing up there. And so the birds would fly up, they would get a little piece of the sun or the sun would give them a piece of the sun and they'd fly back down and they'd lay an egg. And that little yolk was the piece of the sun. Eggs are used as offerings to the spirits. They're used as tools for divination. They're used as protection talisman. If you know, in my book, I talk about krashanki, which are the dyed eggs, dyed a single color. They're hard boiled and we can eat them. And pesanki, which are beautifully, intricately decorated batik eggs made with wax resist method. Those are never cooked and those are never eaten. Those are used as talismans. So eggs are really important in Slavic magic. Now, if you want a little spell using it, just a regular plain egg, plain eggs in and of themselves are very magical as well. They don't have to be dyed or decorated to be magical. So you can take a fresh fertile egg, hold it at the top and the bottom with your index finger and your thumb and visualize your luck and wealth. As you hold it for several minutes, you just think about your luck, your wealth, your success, your happiness, you're like your good life, right? Then once you visualize that for a while, you recite the following incantation. I will go out from door to door, from gate to gate, away from my house, away from my city. I will go to seek my happiness in ways I do not know. Winding paths on all four sides, I will go without turning. My happiness is hidden, hidden deep and strong, not to be found. It is not hidden in a strong chest. It is not hidden behind a heavy door. It is found within the shell of an egg from a chicken. I find my happiness and will not break it. I do not break it on the road, so I do not lose it to anyone and do not give it away. Chickens lay eggs and raise chicks, and I live in wealth. Key, castle, words, it is so. So what you're doing, basically, when you do that incantation is charming that egg to be this mystical egg that holds your happiness. Once you've done that, you wrap the egg in a black cloth and you hide it in a safe, secret place where it will not be touched, will not get broken, and no one will find it. One year later to the day, 
you retrieve that enchanted egg and then you bury it in the ground on your property. And immediately after that, wealth and luck will follow. So you're going out into the, do this visualization where you're going out and getting this magic egg and this egg and that egg come together. And a year later, you're going to have this beautiful talisman. Now, the last magical ingredient, ma magical food that we're going to talk about is salt, seal. So salt is, of course, in many traditions used and is Slavic traditions are no exception. It is used for protection from negative people and from the evil eye. In Slavic culture, many people carry small black bags of blessed table salt as a talisman to ward off evil. There's a really well-known counter curse. When someone says something to you that's a kind of a jealous thing, the counter curse is to say salt into your eyes. Like I'm throwing salt at you, like get your jealousy and your evil eye off of me. Regular salt is quite protective, but there's a special salt, a blessed salt called Chetverhova seal, Chetverhova seal, Thursday salt. Thursday salt is salt that is baked with herbs and rye bread overnight. And as it cooks, it turns a smoky black. So this Thursday salt is very powerful because it has the energy of the herbs, the energy of the bread, and it's this beautiful black salt. Now it can be made at any time. And, uh, but it's particularly powerful It's a, if it's made around spring equinox. Thursday salt has become synchronized with Christianity and it is usually made on Holy Thursday, but it is a pagan practice. And so you can take it out of the Christian calendar and do it around spring equinox. Thursday salt can be used for many protective purposes. You can, if you've had a fight with someone, for example, you can put, or your partner, you've had a fight with your partner, you can put a little bag of Thursday salt under their pillow so that you have a reconciliation quickly. You can use a bag of Thursday salt in your car, suitcase, or backpack for a travel charm. Um, if you have magical tools, they can be cleansed and blessed by placing them in or on a bowl of Thursday salt. Um, if you have a child who's having nightmares or you're afraid you, that they're going to get sick or they're getting bullied at school, you can put a little salt under their pillow and they will be protected. If you put a little Thursday salt in your bath water, it's, it's going to bring beauty and health and happiness. You can add a tiny pinch of Thursday salt to your drinking water to spiritually protect your health. And you can drink that as a potion and a little bowl of Thursday salt can be set in the middle of the table at your dining table to attract happiness, luck, and abundance to your home and your family. You can also sprinkle little bits of this Thursday salt around the corners of your house to guard against evil spirits and keep away people that you don't want or get rid of sort of sad feelings or bad feelings in the home. Lastly, Thursday salt can be added to your wash water for your floors. And if somebody that had bad intentions came into your house, you can wash your floors with that Thursday salt water, or you can sprinkle Thursday salt on their foot footprints after they have left so that they don't come back again. So beautiful practice with Thursday salt. In a minute, I'm going to tell you how to do a traditional bread baking divination and a couple of really easy spells that you can do with honey. But if you would like to learn more about Slavic magic, I invite you to check out my book, Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft. Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft is an exciting book of ancient Slavic magical practices. In this book, you'll sit at Baba Yaga's side and listen to her stories about the birth of the sun, the land of the blessed ones, and the spirits who live right beside us. More importantly, you'll learn the secrets of her magic, crafts, talismans, inscriptions, incantations, and rituals that will allow you to discover your own Baba Yaga within. There is even a whole chapter, chapter 10, that's all about the magic of food. This book is available now. It was out of, it got sold out for a while, but now it's available in all the places and you can order it at your local bookstore, which helps at your local bookstore, or you can get a signed copy from the, me at the Parlor of Wonders. Just go to babayagasbookofwitchcraft.com to order yours today. All right, let's talk about the bread divination. So bread was cooked at home once a week, usually on a Saturday, bread was cooked in the home. Still, you lots of people are getting back into cooking bread after when we were all stuck at home during pandemic, people learned how to cook bread. So here's a fabulous bread divination that you can do. The bread divination was to tell you how your week was going to go. So if bread was made once a week on Saturday, how was the coming week gonna turn out for you? 
if your bread turned out, how your bread turned out sort of said how the week was going to be, your upcoming week was going to be. So if your bread was light and flavorful, it meant that you would have happiness for the coming week and that things would come easily to you. If your bread was flavorful, but was a little dense and heavy, it meant that there was kindness and wisdom in the home, but there might be changes because of people around you, not the people in the home, but the people around you. Um, if your bread was light, but didn't have much flavor and it wasn't very appetizing, it meant greed and laziness. And it meant that someone in the home was taking advantage of a situation. If your bread was tough and chewy, it meant there was a lack of logical thinking by someone in the family and they were being stubborn and resistant and that stubborn resistance might cause trouble. If your bread was dry and hard, it meant there were distractions and secrets. Something was off in the home. Someone in the house might have a secret obsession or there might be a troublesome spirit in the house. If your bread had excessive cracks on the surface, if there were unusual cracks in the bread, it meant there was a warning of danger. You needed to be protected, vigilant, and maybe do some extra magic of protection for that week. If your bread burned, it meant that there would be arguing and anger. Burned bread sends a message that happiness can be brought back if one is willing to make some positive changes. So it's time to make some changes and avoid all that strife and argument. So that was the bread baking divination for all you bread bakers out there. Now, a couple of beautiful spells that can be done with honey, since I'm obsessed with honey, since I had that honey cake right this week. Um, let's talk about an empowerment spell with honey. You can take honey, empower it for a, a, a magical tool that you can use on yourself. Honey contains the condensed energy of the sun. And so you can charge your honey for spells with the sun. Take a jar of honey out in the sun at noon, open it up, bring it to your lips and whisper these words into the jar. As honey is very sweet and gets sweeter in the mouth, so let my power come to me. No one opens their mouth to this honey. This honey sweetness warms, warms only my soul and heals only my body. So be it. So it's saying I'm putting power into this honey, power of the sun, and it will work to bring my power. So very, very powerful spell. The ritual of working with the honey in this way was meant to be done in secret. So you wouldn't tell people about it or do it with someone else. You would do it on your own. And the jar must be kept closed and hidden in a secret place where no one else can find it and take your power because you've got now your power and the sun's power together in this honey. Four days after you charge the honey in this way, you can start to take a teaspoon of this honey on an empty stomach every morning before breakfast, and you will immediately feel a surge of strength and vigor. Now, what about if we want to use honey in a spell on someone else? Well, there's a reconciliation spell with honey. If you have an argument with somebody, you can reconcile with the help of honey. Add a teaspoon of honey to, the, to a cup of tea and whisper the following charm over the brew calm anger, remove old memories, meaning the old bad memories they have that are making them angry at you. You would serve this tea to the person and then it would smooth things over. However, if you had an argument with someone and you weren't on speaking terms and they weren't going to come over for a cup of tea, then you could make this tea, do the incantation, and then sprinkle the tea water on their property. And that would get them back in your good graces. Well, that about does it for this episode of Baba Yaga's Magic. If you'd like to get even more info about Slavic magic, then check out the Learn page over at Parlor of Wonders, where you'll find a ton of resources, including workshops, Slavic magic workshops, blog articles, past podcast episodes, and the way to join me live over Zoom for the Q&A tea party. Just go to parlorofwonders.com and click on the learn tab to see all the goodies there. Thank you to all the Spell Squad members out there who have subscribed to and share this podcast with your friends. Thank you to the fabulous folks who have left reviews on iTunes and Stitcher, and those reviews are so appreciated. Thank you to Jill Navarre for production and engineering. Um, and thank you to you for joining me. I'm looking forward to the next episode when we'll be learning about Slavic healing and uncrossing spells. Until next time, this is Madam Pamita and Baba Yaha saying, 
za mahiu to magic and may all of your stories have the happiest fairy tale endings <laughs>